All right, we're back. Day, no, week, I think six of summer reading. This week, um, I read Smart Couples Finish Rich by David Bach, I think. Um, yeah, um, this was a book suggested from my parents and as the title says, it's just about finance and specifically for couples. Obviously, as a 17 year old, I'm not in a relationship yet. Um, like, like a last, a long lasting one, but um, I still learned a lot. And today I'm gonna share that. So yeah, let's go. Let's start with chapter one. Um, basically, chapter one just sets the base and tells you to like dispel a lot of myths that you may have about like um, relationships and like money. Basically like number one, like loving each other won't stop arguments about money. They're kind of separate things. Um, everyone makes enough to invest, you know, nothing else to be said. Uh, taxes and inflation are never under control. So don't believe someone when they say like, it's all good. Um, if you don't start talking about money, everything will be okay. Yeah, like that's just a wrong belief apparently. Um, in the end, if you f practice this, you'll only end up broke and no one wants to do that. Chapter two, uh, he goes into, like the author goes into some practices that you can do um, to like kind of just know why you're making money in the first place. So he says to list down your values, such as like freedom, security, marriage, and health, which is different from goals. Um, and he like, he like specifically like says to like not focus on goals, such as like making a million dollars or like um, having date nights, exercising more. Like those are goals, but he wants us to focus on our values, which are more important. And he kind of summarizes this in like a weird way. He has like a list of like the most important things to do in your life. So there's like be, do, and have. So yes, it's like B-E-D-O-H-A-V-E. -E. I said that right. Um, essentially, what he's saying is that like as a whole, we all focus too much on like the do and have portion of life um when rather like focusing on the b part is more important as it's tied to our values right like i want to be secure but having a gucci tracksuit does not mean i'm gonna be secure right like that's having a gucci tracksuit is a have um doing i don't know some crazy expensive thing it's, it's a it's an action it's not like a value so yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Um, and basically, to sum it up, he's just saying like, you you should make like what you do with your money surrounding surround your values and find ways to improve um, the way that you're using money um, towards those values. Like, I don't know, there's, there's so many examples. Just read this book. All right. Number three, I actually wrote this stuff down. Um, number three, he kind of just sum it up. He just tells you to like have your finance in order and like look fit, like literally just have all your like documents in like in a folder. And that's about it. Chapter four. Interesting. The latte factor. So now David is talking about like, um, his like past experience as a talker and as a financial planner. Everybody always came up to him with the excuse of like, yo, I don't have enough money. I can't, I can't save this. You know, I don't make enough. And he's like, that's cat because the latte factor. Basically in a day, you spend a lot more money on the small things than you think, which, you know, adds up to a lot in a year. And an actionable step that he gives us is to track your spendings every single day for a whole week and then you know 
calculate how much money you're spending in a year. Uh, pretty cool idea. Not so revolutionary, but I think some people needs to hear that. Anyways, number five, chapter five, sorry. Um, retirement basket. So now we're moving on to like real life kind of like terms and stuff. Um, and what he's talking about with retirement basket is just like the amount of money and like savings that you need to retire like in your whatever, 50s, 60s, 40s, I don't know. Um, so yeah, it, one term that I wrote is asset allocation. So that's like a big part, right, of retirement. Well, how much should you invest in something that's safe or something that's volatile, like the stock market? Basically, asset allocation just like tells you, um, it's like a way of saying how much you should um, allocate to these certain areas. And a rule of thumb that he just gives you is to subtract your age um, from 110. So right now, let's say I was 40, right? Let's say I was 40. I would do 110 minus 40 which gives me 70%. Now, in his rules, he says to take that number that you get, like the, the, the difference, yeah, the difference, and then um, put that in volatile, like ways of money, whatever, storage. So like stocks. Um, and then keep the 40% in a safe income kind of, is it, am I saying that? Yeah, like a safe income. In safe income. I, I don't know. You, you know what I mean. Basically, just do that and you're going to be chilling. Um, even simpler, if you just want like a very simple like rule, 60% stocks and 40% in something safe. There we go. Can't go much easier. And that's all for retirement. There's a ton of stuff about like RSP retirement stuff um that's actually important i should talk about that <laughs> okay. yeah, all right uh oh yeah big thing apparently if you just put 10 percent of your pre-tax income into your retirement plan each year you're gonna be pretty rich like there's a graph in here that shows like if you did that like, like age 20 You'd be like a millionaire at like freaking, I don't know, 40. Like you just, just get the book, just read it. Um, and then he, he says, if you want to be really rich, put 20%. It's kind of hard though, kind of hard, but you know, just think of the latte factor, how you can save money and you'll get there. Okay. And now more about RSP. Yeah. So all this money that you like the 10% that you saved or 20, whatever, um, that you've been saving, you want to put that into an RRSP. And this essentially allows you to compound your money while not being taxed by the government, which is huge because um, you'd lose a lot of money that way. And it's kind of hard to explain RRSP. The way I would say like, like how it makes money is that essentially you're storing away money that you make right now as a young man into like, you know, your RSP. And then you take that money out when you're a lot older. And this earns you money because essentially like, oh, okay, like obviously compound interest. But other than that, you avoid like being taxed more. Kind of like, you basically you get charged more in taxes as a young man who is still working than if you were like, you know, like in your 60s and not working because you'll be taxed less. So essentially you're like kind of avoiding the government by like less taxes. You get the point. Um, that's that. Next. Okay. So we have a retirement basket and now we have we need to have a security basket. Now, what is a security basket? Essentially, it's just a basket of money, right? Like just like the retirement basket, it's a large sum of money that you save for like 
emergencies. So like someone dies, someone gets injured, car crash, whatever. You want to save around 24 months worth of expenses in that security basket. So that way you're safe. Um, now, the common question is, where should I put all this money into in your security basket? The author suggests that you put it in a mutual fund that will pay you around 2% in annual interest, which is, you know, at least you're making money, right? Like you're, you're still getting money if you put it in a mutual fund, right? So it's good. <laughs> and uh, he moves on to talk about the importance of setting up a trust or a will because I mean, if not, where will your part, where will your property, where will your property go? Number one, number two, what happens to your kid or family? Number three, what happens if you get in camp, incapacitated, blah, blah, blah. Incapac I give up. If you get disabled, like he, he, he kind of wrote something that like was kind of eye opening for me. This includes like pulling the plug. And if you don't know what that means, like that means like if you're on the deathbed or not deathbed, um, if you're on like a, I don't know, in the, in the hospital and you're like on life support, pulling the plug means like they're shutting it off and you basically die. Um, this part of the will basically assures you that like no one in your family has to make that decision, which I was like, damn. I don't want to put my family through that. Like, I want to just decide for myself that, like, I want to go out. So, set up a will, please. Now, the biggest mistakes with, like, setting these up um, is that, number one, you want to keep everything up to date. Do not procrastinate. Like, just get this done. And do not hide the documents where no one can find them. Because no one wants to, like, you know you're dying and then they still have to find your will like come on dude <sighs> that's a fumble and then anyways how much life insurance to buy right so he kind of asks you like everything in this book is about you right so it asks you who relies on your income right now what does it cost to those who depend on you to live for a whole year are there any debts that need to be paid do you have company policies or surrounding uh, death benefits? Um, and essentially, in the end, after you tally everything together, you want to make sure that your death benefit, which by the way, I forgot to mention, is basically how much money you get or like whatever blank you get after you die. In the end, he says that you should have six to 20 times your annual spendings as your death benefit. So, you know, if I made $10,000 a year, I'd want my death benefit to be like from 60,000 to like, you know, 200,000. So, you know, it's, it's quite a lot of money. Uh, and then, yeah, so that's everything about like, oh, that's not everything. Oh yeah, cause, okay, we figured out what to like, oh wait. Okay, we figured out what you should put into your security basket, what you should do with like wills and like why you should. Now let's talk about the types of life insurance. All right, this is gonna be long. Oh my God, it's ready. Okay, yeah. Okay, the types of insurance. There's two. There's type or permanent. Let's first talk about type. So type, no, not type. Oh my God, term. Term or permanent. So let's talk about term. Basically term is like a, a contract. You can pay for a range of like, um, of like this however many years, usually from like five to 30 years. And the pros are that it's cheap and easy to set up, but the cons are that it builds no cash value. Meaning, if you paid it for 30 years straight, you paid all the premiums, you, 
you were like a good guy. In the end, if you cancel it, you get nothing back, which is not what you want. That's where um, the other type of... Oh, I forgot to write this down. Whatever. This is where we have to look at the types of term life insurances now. So the first type of term invest insurance is annual renewable terms so these terms um are special in the fact that their death benefit remains the same each year but you each year you pay more in premium um as you get older because obviously insurance companies know if you get older you're more likely to die so that's that's not good but it is less expensive to set up at first than the next term which is called a level term insurance all right level term insurances are the same as annual or renewable terms but their premium stays the same and their initial cost to set up is i think he said a bit more but i think it's a lot more um it's just more okay it's more to set up at the start but if you think about it, this will eventually pay it off because in the other one, you have to like increase your premium each year because, you know, you're getting older, you're going to die. Level term, you just set it up once and you never have to pay like a more premium each year. So in the long run, he suggests you should just go with level term because you're saving money in the long run. And in this book, there's like a I forgot to uh, write down about permanent terms or insurances. I don't want to. It's like, what, what time is it? It's it's one. Are you kidding me? I literally, I stayed up just to finish a book. Because this week I was doing other stuff. Give me a break. So that's it. Learn about permanent terms on your, like, whatever, on your own time. Um, dream. Okay, now chapter seven. Finally, dream basket. This video is going to be so long. Jesus Christ. Okay, dream basket. This is where you put all your money for your dreams and your, you know, to have fun in life. Basically, sum it up 3% of your income. I got a speed run. Okay, and then eight is bad habits to not do uh, as a couple trying to get rich. Uh, there's just like 10 habits. I'll just read them. Okay, number one, having a 20-year, 25-year mortgage. Number two, not taking credit card debt seriously. Number three, trying to get rich quick by day trading. Don't do it. Number four, buying stocks on margin. Number five, not starting an educational saving plan soon enough. Number six, not teaching your kids about money. Uh, number seven, neglecting to sign a prenup prenuptial agreement i don't know oh that's that's like a like to sign up in case you divorce with your partner to see who gets what anyways back to it number eight not having a great purpose behind uh beyond the two of you number nine not figuring out who's responsible for what and finally number 10 not getting professional financial advice okay last chapter Oh yeah, okay, last chapter, it literally just talks about how you can get a raise of 10%. I don't need to go over this. Like, it's so simple, just... <sighs> okay, I'll go over it. Week one, get real. Be real with yourself. Um, are you contributing? Week two, write down what you want everywhere in your house, which is a weird tip, but, you know, he's him. Week three, clean up your office. Week four, get clear of how you add value. Week five, focus on the 80-20 rule. Week six, put yourself in play. Hype yourself up. Week seven, practice by yourself. Week eight, ask for a raise. And week nine, even if things go south, celebrate your success. And that's that. That's that. He ends off in a beautiful message of like, life is short, be sure to love others, and money isn't everything.
What a great guy. Great book. Would read it again. Out of 10. Bro, I don't know. This taught me a lot. Like, I did not know much of this at all before. So I'll give it like a, an 8 or a 9. I think I'll go with a 9, actually. Even though I don't, you know, I don't have a couple. Like, I'm not a couple. Um, I don't have a girlfriend yet. Um, it's still a good book. And would I recommend it to someone who's, like, new? Uh, they were, like, trying to get their finance together? 100%. 8 or a 9. Probably a 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. 8.5. 8.5 out of 10. Really like the book. And now, I have a new book, which I will get. Oh, baby. I've been waiting for this one. Had my brother order it. The Way of the Superior Man by by this guy, David. D Data? I wanted to read this for so long. And now I'm going to get my alpha grind on. Okay. Anyways, that's that. I'm going to go to sleep. Yeah. That concludes like week six, I think. I think. But yeah.